Hello and welcome to our Hearst Festival Cocktail Masterclass. My name is Jacob Jackman. I'm a cocktail bartender from London, now living in Sussex. I've worked in some of the top bars and restaurants in both London, Brighton and other places around the world. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how to make a good cocktail and specifically gin. Now, gin is the British best friend. It's been with us every step of the way and it's still here rising back again in prominence. So let's have a look at how to make a really lovely gin cocktail. We're going to be talking about Tom Collins, one that you're sure you've all heard of in a bar or in a restaurant, or perhaps just making them for yourself at home. So today we're going to be looking at how to make them the best way we possibly can. So what makes a good cocktail? Well, for me, there's three elements. There's good ingredients, there's balance, and there's dilution. Good ingredients is simple, just make sure you've got some quality alcohol, some freshly squeezed citrus juice, and some homemade sugar syrup for today. And balance, well, that's all about the flavors that you're using. Is it sweet? Is it sour? Is it salty? Is it bitter? A combination of all these elements leads to a perfect cocktail. And last but not least, we have dilution. This is the area that takes the most practice, but once you get the hang of it, you'll be bashing out cocktails like the best of us. So, let's talk a little bit about gin. So, gin has been with us for a very long time, since the end of the 1600s, roughly. But where did it come from? It didn't just burst into existence. Well, it was actually the Dutch who were drinking a spirit known as Geneva or Geneva, which was a distilled malt wine that had been flavored heavily with juniper. Juniper, as we know, is the key ingredient in gin, but it's been used in medicinal spirits since as far back as 70 AD. It's been a prevalent item in all sorts of doctoral and medicinal concoctions for a very, very, very long time. And gin is no different. The Dutch believed that Geneva had perfect medicinal qualities, an idea that passed over to the British, but we managed to botch it quite heavily, as we are wont to do. So how did it get to us? Well, our first experience of it was when we were fighting against the Dutch, in fact. We saw these crazed madmen with little clay pots of alcohol sprinting across the field with absolutely no care in the world, reckless abandon, complete nutters. And so we nicknamed this courage that was getting into them via liquid form Dutch courage, something that has stuck with us for a very, very long time. Now, it wasn't for a little while until the British kind of got a taste for it for themselves, but we actually named our new king, after we finally ousted the Catholics, as William III, or more better known as William of Orange, a Dutchman been brought over and given the English throne. Now, like any good British or English king of the time, he immediately went to war with the French. This is a trend that had been going on for a long, long time in the 16-1700s, and William III was no different whatsoever. So he immediately levied sanctions against French imports such as wine and brandy to make it harder for them to boost their economy and harder for them to sell their products to the British English. Now, alongside this, he passed a number of corn laws which made it very, very cheap to produce and distill Cor uh, grain and corn and barley and things like that, which made it very, very cheap to make this new substance he had brought over with him, Geneva. Now, it's probably a fact that the British were far too drunk to say the word Geneva, and they decided to just reduce it to gen, which became anglicized over a long time into the word gin. So it was very, very cheap to make gin. Cheaper to make than beer by far, and safer to drink than water at this period. So people were guzzling it back by the absolute pint load. And I mean that, pints and pints of gin a day. And this wasn't your household Gordon's gin. This was strong bathtub sort of gin made in someone's back garden. It was lethal, quite literally. Been cut with turpentine, sawdust, anything, you name it, people were chucking it in there. And it started to become a real problem around the 1730s. So we're talking already, it's been around for 30 years and people are still going hard. Now, gin and gingerbread became a thing when the River Thames froze over and people to try and stop themselves from quite literally freezing to death would go to the local bar and they would knock back pints of gin and eat gingerbread. The government at this point were probably thinking, 
okay, maybe we should do something about this. But it wasn't for another seven years when they realized this gin craze, as it became known after the effect, was sweeping across the nation and causing a lot of damage. Our economy had pretty much ground to a halt. Everyone was either drunk, insane, both, or just dead. And the country was in racks and ruins. But the government stepped in and passed a number of gin acts. The first meaning you had to pay £50, an unbelievable amount of the time, to have a gin maker's licence. And the second, the important one, in 1751, which meant that only people who could produce a huge amount of gin were allowed to do so. Now, this has all seemed rather macabre up until now, but we've got it out of our system. The English had shaken off the cobwebs and we were back in full force. Only a few people were making gin from this point on, and it wasn't until the late 1800s that it came back into prominence. The British were travelling all across the world, setting up their empire. And in a lot of places in the world, malaria is prevalent, so they were being instructed to take quinine everywhere they went with them. Now, I don't know if any of you have had quinine on its own, it's extraordinarily unpleasant. So Schweppes released their Indian tonic water, which made it far more palatable. And the English, being the English, decided the best thing to do with it would be to chuck some gin in there as well. The gin and tonic was born, and it slowly crept back from the military into British society and swept its way through the, the higher upper classes where they would go to gin palaces, stand around guffawing at one another, knocking back gin and standing in very plush carpets that one could find oneself sinking into. So, where does the Tom Collins come into all of this? Tom Collins is very similar to a gin and tonic in that it is gin plus a nice fizzy mixer. But the difference is we add a few extra elements and take away some of that bitterness. So, we've got our gin, we've got freshly squeezed lemon juice, and we've got sugar syrup. This is the very base concept of a Tom Collins. We also have soda water. Not tonic, just soda. So I'm going to start off with our gin. Get your cocktail shaker. I'm using Tanqueray today, a house favourite. We go 40 millilitres of gin. Next up is our lemon juice, freshly squeezed, the fresher the better. 25 millilitres of that. And then we're going to have our sugar syrup. I make mine at home, one to one, so let's say 200 litres, 200 millilitres of water, 200 grams of sugar. Simple as that. 12 and a half millilitres of that. And then we're going to add our ice. So, we talked before about dilution. What does that mean? Well, when you shake something, you're not only making it cold, but you're also adding a little bit of water as the ice breaks down through the shaking. You don't want to shake it for too long, otherwise you'll have a watery mess. But don't shake for long enough and it'll taste far too alcoholic. So you want to get a nice balance. And technique is everything. I like to go up, in, down and out. So. Voila. So for a Tom Collins, you're going to want a Collins glass, a highball or anything resembling a nice tall long glass. Add some ice to the glass. And pour in our concoction. Following this, we're going to top it up with soda water. And garnish with a nice lemon wedge. So, this is the most simple form of a Tom Collins. But the great thing about a Tom Collins is you can expand on it. So, for example, right here I have Campari mixed with orange liqueur. I like my drinks a little bit bitter, and I love a bit of orange. So I'm just going to add a splash of this. 
up that lovely pink color. And you can really experiment with whatever you want to try throwing in there. Delicious. Hope you enjoy.